Welcome back from lunch. I hope everybody enjoyed lunch. And we've got a really good program this afternoon. And starting off, we'll have, and I don't know if I can even go for the last name here, so I'll go for Jan, so DG8NGN, and I understand that's a vanity call sign? For no. Next Generation Network. Okay, I've been told <laughs> by a little bird on that. And he's going to talk to us about the European Hamnet, a large-scale high-radio, high-speed radio network. Go ahead, Don. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the European Hamnet, which is a very large-scale, high-speed radio network. Uh, my name is Jan Draszewski, <laughs> and the call sign is DG8NGN, and I'm from the German Amateur Radio Club, DRLC. And this, I suggest that we start with opening up the notebooks and type in the URL you have in there, hamnetdb.net. So you could follow the talk a little bit easier. So on the right side we see a typical installation. We have some interlinks, uh, interlink antennas, and we have for user access antennas, inc including the transceivers which are nano stations from UbiKitty in uh, four directions. So, who am I? I'm the VHF UHF microwave manager from our club, and I'm also active in frequency management. We need to fight against um, yeah, the people who want to catch all of our spectrum. So I'm pretty active in that area right now. I'm in the 44Net IP coordination team together with Thomas from Berlin and Eckbert. And I'm one of the founders of the ISCDDB network. You might be aware of that. This is a network for where we um, use our D-Star radios on. Together with Hans-Jürgen Diel 5DR and um, Michael DL1 BFF from Berlin. So in my profession, I'm a system engineer for spectrum monitoring systems at Rode and Schwarz. You may be aware of it uh, in Munich, in the headquarter. Okay, uh, my abstract, well, this is the only thing what it made into the proceedings. Unfortunately, time was very short. So uh, I'll just skip that. You all have this in the proceedings. Yeah, about the network. What we see here now is most, most of Germany, Austria, Switzerland, some parts of uh, France. And um, I want to describe a little bit what, what we see here. So, the approximately size is, let's say, 1,000 by 1,000 kilometers. And uh, the red dots are inactive nodes. The green ones are active nodes. Some green have, like these here, they have a, a U in there, which means they have a user access. And um, yeah, between these nodes, these are inactive. These are, yeah, maybe in future we will use them here. And um, yeah, sometimes we cannot connect the full network by radio. So what we do is we use normal VPN technology in order to connect all these islands together. Um, yeah, this goes by L2TP or by IPIP. Yeah, and what is difficult here is we have here Germany, and if we cross the border, different rules apply. So we need to find out how we can get in touch with each other, either by, let's say, ISM connections on public Wi-Fi, or we go by VPN, or even we have the same spectrum we can share, and then we can use normal radio links on the amateur bands. That doesn't work anymore? Ah, oh, it does. Yeah, this is our standard deployment example. We use here some microtic devices. Uh, we have the router here with uh, some passive P power over Ethernet, which goes by the LAN cable directly to the, to the device. Here we have a typical mid-range uh, antenna, which is uh, 23 dBi and uh, I think one watt output power or something on five gigahertz. Um, and here, if we want to make any longer range connection, then we go for the 30 dBe antennas. And yeah, for the user access, we'll 
you, we, have, we are lucky we are the band from 2,320 to 2,300, uh, no, to 2,400 we have uh, in the spectrum in Germany, so we can use it for, for access without any disturbance from the normal public Wi-Fi network. Yeah. Then we have a typical example that we have seen on the first page with some Ubiquiti soft, uh, hardware, which we usually use for directly peer-to-peer -peer connects and for user access. These are the four devices we have seen on the first page. They are 16 dB TBI and up to 27 dBm output power. Um, personally, I prefer a little bit the micro, microtic stuff because you, you, you have more options um, for tweaking the installation. Um, especially if you're if we are talking about point to multipoint installations where we put uh, user access on top of it. Sometimes you need to check whether these antennas and the transceivers, whether the antennas are fitting all the frequency ranges you want to use. So usually you get from the manufacturer uh, um, a normal chart where you can see frequency over gain. Uh, so if you hit the right uh, frequency, then you have the full gain. Otherwise, you might lose some of these 23 dB dBi. Um, now about some of the network management and the principles we use for the IAP allocations. Um, I want to keep the experimental nature of amateur radio live. So what we designed is we just give out IP addresses and so-called AS numbers, which are used on the, even on the internet. An AS is a normal autonomous system called. And we have per autonomous system roughly around about 15 to 20 nodes inside. And this will create a region. And a region can have a single um, different uh, administrator. So it doesn't need to be administrated. For, uh, the full network doesn't need to be administrated by, by just one people or, or just a small group but we just give out the resources in order to, to do it on their own and give some instructions how to do this. So they are able to learn, uh, to learn a, a lot of um, how to do backbone networking. Um, yeah, what we do is we have each region will speak to the other regions by the ex external BGP protocol. Uh, who has heard about BGP so far? Okay, all right, that's good. And um, yeah, the IP addresses to deploy the network are usually coming from the um, IP coordination team, which is uh, Brian Cantor here. He's maintaining the 44 slash 8 network somewhere around maybe. And um, here in Germany, we have two blocks. It's 44130 slash 16 and 44224 slash 15, which is the new range where we deployed all our Hemnet stuff. So, um, each region needs an um, AS number. For that to work, uh, we don't use the public AS numbers from the IP uh, from the internet. We are using the uh, private AS space, which is defined in the RFC 1930, which is 64512 to 65535, at least in that RFC. <laughs> and um, what we did is we said, okay, um, this is our web page where we put all the information for the German uh, allocations on. So we can find there how we split it uh, or how we uh, associate, associated the different AS numbers, which are in the private space to the different countries so far. And if a new country is coming up, um, we, we just say, OK, um, there's enough play, place here. We could find some place for, for the new country then. But it's already a little bit, um, yeah. We need to take care not to, uh, to waste all these uh, numbers because uh, they are limited right now. Anyway, um, there's no no real uh, coordination for that so far. We just say, okay, another country appeared who has interest in the Hamnet. Let's, let's, let's just give them a, a block of AS numbers. And the AS numbers must need not to be into, uh, let's say, um, yeah, in any order. 
So you could even uh, have different AS numbers for to, different, to the same country. Okay. Yeah, now we requested a, um, I have seen in the 32 bit range from, for the AS numbers, I haven't seen any allocations for, 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 for private usage, so we requested it. And as you can see in, the, in July 2013, uh, the RFC 6996 um, considered to, to have the new range, which, were, which is a very large number here. Uh, so we can even use this right now. But it's not coordinated yet. It's just for experience and thoughts how we can do the coordination on this. Yes? What's an AS number? It's an autonomous uh, system number. It's just a number for a region, and you need that in order to uh, connect different... Uh, regions by the BGP protocol. <laughs> All right? Okay. How do we solve the routing inside a region? Um, since we say that each region is free to use the favorite routing protocol, you could experiment by OLSR, by Batman, OSPF, or internal BGP, for example. And um, internal BGP is very often used. If you maintain a full mesh in an uh, IBGP network, this is going to be not too easy to maintain because you need to have a full mesh. And with each node, the number of links will rise. And that is really a pain to, to administrate then. So we think about how to solve it. We go by the route reflector, which is unfortunately a single point of failure then. So this was not a good solution either. And then we found out that we could use a BGP confederation, which means that you have in your region, you can, uh, we reserved some, some AS numbers for that purpose. And um, yeah, within, so each side in that area will get its own AS number, which is used internally. And for externally, uh, external communication, um, eBGP is, is used. That is for the routing. So let's see. So how do we go on with the deployment of the sites? I have seen, um, did you open up the hemnetdb.net already? So this is all the extracts of, the, of that site. And there, you just pick one of the maintainers in that list on that site. Maybe you know some of them. If not, just ask me. And you can create an account on that uh, platform. And we have already roughly 150 maintainers of networks there. So they maintain not only networks, but even sites in order to find out which site can you interconnect to each other. So how can we create a new site? We log into the hamnetdb.net, click on sites, press new site, fill in the data, like call sign, descriptive name, latitude, longitude, and meters above ground, which is very important. Not the sea level, but it's ground. And uh, you put in the separated list of maintainers. If you do this, you know, there has been a shutter radar topography uh, mission once with the, NAS uh, with the, with the a space shuttle around the world in order to get the, the hate data of the full world. And this is public available. And with that data, we can easily calculate um, the Fresnel zone and, and the, the, not Fresnel, Fresnel zone, sorry. We can easily calculate um, the terrain between two points in the oils. Um, we use a website from heywhatsthat.com <laughs> in order to create these pictures. You just give in um, uh, uh, the frequency, you give the parameters uh, of the coordinates, and you will get this out of it. So what we have here is, if you um, put in your site in here, you just uh, look up your site, and there's a, um, an area which says other sites nearby. And then you have a list, and you just click here on the profile, and you get an easy way whether you have direct line of sight or not. And if you have, you can be pretty sure the link will work. It doesn't matter how long it is. We can even run it on, on, on 150 kilometers without any problems, if you have line of sight. Excuse me, what was that website? Hamnetdb.net. That's uh, exactly, yeah. 
Okay, a little bit about um, link budget calculation. This is yeah, very common. You check the data sheet of your transceiver. It says it has some gain, you have some TX power, and uh, TX power at the highest uh, modulation and coding scheme is uh, 24 dBm. So this is the worst case scenario. And the worst case for MCS7 reception, which is capable to have the full rate, is minus 78 dBm. And um, yeah, again, check the losses of the antenna gain by looking in the chart gain versus frequency if provided by the manufacturer. We don't care about these because these are for um, 802.11G, and nowadays we already use 802.11N, and this is where we work with MCS values for the different coding schemes. All right, so you can easily find any calculation tool on the internet uh, in order to, to, to put in the values we just have. The, the link we have just seen has 38 kilometers, which is in here, and you put the output power in here, the antenna gain, and you will get the receiving level. That's it. And with that receiving level, we have, yeah, still 7 dB um, left for inaccuracy. For example, that uh, there are some losses uh, in the cables or whatever. Um, so this is valid for a 20 megahertz bandwidth uh, um, ch um, signal. If you go down to 10 megahertz, you will get 3 dB more gain. Respectively, 6 dB narrowing down to 5 megahertz. But the throughput will suffer with the same factor. So if you lower the bandwidth, you will get 3 dB more gain, but you will lose bandwidth, what you can get through the link, by a half. So, since we have horizontal and vertical polarization, um, we can use two special streams, and we get a result of 130 megabit brutto, not netto. So we can transfer a lot of data in there, in that channel. Why is that number here? It's the guard interval. The guard interval is possible from 802.11n. There's an option that you can shorten the guard interval for um, the inter-symbol interference uh, might be affected there, and so you need to take care of whether you can use it or not on your link. Okay, now we come to spectrum regulatory. Before deploying a radio link, you need to check the rules which apply for your country. In Germany, automatic radio stations need a special license. They get a special license like uh, DB0 XYZ. Is it Y? Yeah. Uh, from Regulation Authority. It's called BNETS R A. And uh, it's currently 200 euros per call once. You don't need to re-assign uh, for it. And um, yeah, different rules will apply per band or even per frequency range. For example, we are not allowed on at automatic stations to run more than 15 watts ERP um, above 30 megahertz, and we are limited to 10 megahertz bandwidth, which is uh, not too good. But we can, even with that parameters, can get a, a good network. Um, yeah, then we need to look our, uh, to look on our spectrum allocation status. So we are secondary user, we're not a primary user in that bands. And um, so we need to request for a license and the request will go to the primary user to check whether we can use the frequency there because it might be blocked already by, by the uh, primary user. And then it gets denied. And usually it takes you roughly four to five months until you get your license and you applied for it. So sharing is Wi-Fi, at least this is valid for Germany. If you look what Wi-Fi can do with the parameters, um, we have maximum output of 15 watts. Wi-Fi has one watt if it's using dynamic frequency selection and transmit power control. They don't need a license. We need a license. We are bandwidth limited. They are not. Um, and we have further restrictions like no identify, we need to identify, we need to have uh, no encryption, limited content we can transfer there. 
which is un, uh, more or less no restrictions here, but they need to um, make, implement the radar detection in that bands. So is it all worth just for 12 dB more gain to use amateur radio rather than Wi-Fi? I think yes, the reason come, will come. Um, so if you are able to run a link with ISM parameters, just do so. Why not? So it saves some more spectrum we can use for, for amateur radio then. What happens if, if you try to share with radars? We don't have any problem there because we have our license there and we have seen that the primary user is okay with that. But you can see here, the Wi-Fi emissions without radar detection are disturbing weather radars. Here, some rain in Romania or Hungary or in Croatia. But what is not rain is what you see in Slovakia and Poland, these here. Yeah? So you see that circle? And this circle is exactly stopping here. So the radar is, hidden by, is, is hit by a Wi-Fi signal and thinks that here's rain. This will happen if you don't take care on spectrum sharing. Good. So we don't share even by, we even share by other amateur radio applications. Um, we look in the IAU band plan, we look into national band plans. What we have even he heard yesterday is um, end of modes. You remember? And um, we are running different kind of digital links right now. Digital ATV, packet radio, hamnet. But we're trying to set up our band plans just to reflect the bandwidth we are using, not the application types. So if we do so, we can just carry all our data in, in, a, in, a, diff, in a special bandwidth. For example, we can carry TCP IP and DATV links, or we can carry hamnet uh, no, sorry, Hamlet can carry IPTV or packet radio. So all we need to do is to build a very large backbone and run all our applications on it. Yeah, let's talk about identification. Radio amateurs need to identify in, in regular intervals. I think it's 10 minutes here in the US. Um, yeah, the very easy way is the ESSID, but how do you find out if you have this SSID, which, which station is really transmitting them? Because you have an access point and you have a client and you will not find out which one is who now. So you can have a convention if you take the first one in AP mode and the second one in station mode, then it's clear. But how to handle then this point to multipoint link? So this is not a satisfying uh, situation. What we did once because in the early beginning from the hamnet, we, we were able to um, test new stuff by Article 16 of our, of, of our law in Germany if you provide a very detailed plan how to identify and how to take care of all the, the stuff we need. So what we designed is um, there's a bit um, from the MAC addresses that you can locally administer set a, a, a MAC address. You know that the MAC addresses come normally by vendor, but if you decide to, to, to put another MAC address in, you're free to do so. So what we did is we encoded the call sign, even with some SSID, into the MAC address. So you could identify by MAC address, but it's very complicated and not very useful. So what we have here is uh, we have neighbor discovery protocols like Cisco discovery protocol or microtic neighbor discovery protocol or whatever. And you just set your identify call sign in that uh, little box. And then if you do a neighbor list scan, you see that broadcasts will come every minute. And this is enough for identification. So just put in the, the, the call sign and that's it. Um, yeah, the, for the deployment, we have a 44.224-50 network for full German Hamnet. And we decided to split them into so-called backbone networks and user service networks. And the backbone networks 
for each region, they will get a slash 23. And for the deployment of user and services, they will get a slash 22. So each region will get its own IP address space and its own AS number. This is even reflected in the Hamnet database, hamnetdb.net. So we see here the AS numbers and we see, um, let's see on the next page, we see all the IP address resources which are, which are belonging to a special AS number. So how are we going to do the IP subnetting then? Um, we found out that best practices that each single site has just one BGP router or one router at all. We will uh, get a slash 27 network for the site, not the region, but the site. And um, from the maintainer from the site, uh, sorry, from the maintainer from the region, the site will get a slash 27 network. And we will keep the next one free in order uh, if the IP address uh, space is not enough, then you can, could extend it to the slash 26. So the site network will be announced by the router to the network. And the site network can be split internally into more different networks as you like, like a slash 28 for users or a slash 28 for services. Why do you want to, to have this? because of easy firewalling. I divide into controlled area and uncontrolled area. So the controlled area is where I deploy my services in. Usually you want to have, uh, let's say your D-star repeater or uh, all your stuff you put on the side, you want to have, to connect, uh, have a connection to the internet. And I'm allowing the internet for the full site, but for the uh, users, I don't allow it. I just allow 44 slash 8 for them. So I can easily set a firewall rule in order to, to say that only my services are allowed and the users, which I have no control of because they are coming from RF, they cannot go into uh, the internet from here. Yeah, for the interconnection, we use simply slash 29 network and we start from zero and just go up until uh, we have a lot of transfer networks in the region. That's it. Um, yeah, this is very nice to know. If you know the HamletDB provides, the HamletDB provides a very good network management. And you can, the, if you know this data structure inside, you can work very, very good with it. A host belongs always to a site. You need to define it when you, when you um, create a host. And a host belongs automatically to a subnet. If you have a subnet and you have an IP address, uh, then it's by nature, if, if the, sub, the IP address is in the subnet, then it belongs to the subnet, that's it. And uh, the subnet belongs to an AS, which is again user defined. And the HamnetDB is able to visualize this, this data. So this is an example for, uh, uh, from Munich on our student home. And you can see we have here a backbone network, which is deployed on 44.224.10.48.29 on that frequency here. And we know this, is, this IP address is in there and that IP address is in there. And th since this IP address is belonging to db 0 ZM and this IP address in the same network is belonging to DB0 TVM, it auto automatically knows this, that there must be a link between them. And so the graphic will come automatically up. Okay. Um, on the overview of, of the DB0 ZM station, we can see all the hosts which are inside. If they are green, they are active. If they are red, they are currently down. You can assign some DHTCP range for local services or for the users. And this is very neat. You see here, edited last time. And I need to mention that, um, that um, you see the record. It's already 667 days old. And Everything is recorded in that, so you have a history. You don't will lose any data. The data will be backed up each day, and 
uh, the history is from the beginning of the entry available. You can even show what is happening there. And then you have all the maintenance in there. If some el somebody else is changing this value, he will do that under his name. So you will see who has edited the records the last time. It's me and it's Flory. Okay, so this is uh, what we, this is an automatic system, how it, um, db 0 set m, this is your surrounding subnets you see here. It has three links, it has one side network, and it belongs to one AS. And the next nearby stations, you can see here, the list is even longer than the page. So this is a document of the uh, station. You see one microtic board here with the two links, another board with two links, here some camera servers, here Raspberry Pi and switch. And on the lower part, you see all the other stuff in here, NetIO and a server, another Raspberry Pi, a URI board for the old Starlink network, and so on. So this is how we document, or at least I document, some do not. Okay. How is a typical user setup? Um, a user has its own DSL router, and it has a default route. And you can, on the most routers, you can set a special route, uh, like 44 slash 8 should go over another device which is within the network. So you could decide that this router should uh, send all the packages which are belonging to the hamnet or the AMPR net should go that way because you know the IP address of that device in there. And all, and you just set the IP address and all devices in your local network are on. That's it. And for that reason, again back, keep 44 slash 8 for radio amateurs only. This is very important to let this work. Okay, deployment of DNS, this is, yeah. <laughs> Germany has currently uh, a national DNS concept under the uh, domain de.ampr.org, which is the, the domain of uh, the 44 net IP address space. And the HandyDB automatically can generate all the DNS zone files, what you need in order to, to set up your, your server. And so you can run on each region, each AS could, could run, if, if them like, to a DNS server. But we are offering a service that all the entries you put in the Hamnet DB are automatically synced um, with the DNS hub in Germany. That is my station at the University of Applied Science in Nuremberg. And they are going to the flat NPR.org zone once a day. And there's a data flow diagram. Well, I will skip that. <laughs> it's posted on the 44NET uh, list once. But uh, you can get this uh, presentation afterwards. So how do I interconnect with the, with the international world then? You may be aware of that portal.ampr.org where you could deploy your 44NET stuff. And I have a big machine at the university and it will import um, all the IP IP routes which are available on the 44 network are imported and sent on the BGP network of the Hamlet. And the other way around, I registered my gateway at portal.amp.org for that, these subnets. So all the international traffic will come for, for these subnets will come at the university. And there we'll put it into the Hamnet. So we have an interconnection, an international interconnection on the IP IP network right now. Um, yeah, even for this, we have some data flow diagrams. So I even want to interconnect by packet radio, which is very, very neat. You could, what I learned all my TCP IP knowledge just by looking at the AX25 stack because it was so slow I got all my knowledge <laughs> about the IP uh, and TCP and uh, all the things on top. So you can easily read how SMTP works. That's really, really, really nice. 
So we have, in Germany, we have a call, a, a node on the Picket Radio Network. It's called iGate. It's, it's a virtual call. And you, if, you, if, you ha have the, um, if you have connection to the Picket Radio world uh, on the FlexNet network, then you are able to connect to that, to that node here. And here, you can see, this is my Packet Radio terminal. I just connected to my repeater, connected to iGate. I looked up the RP entries in there. You can see already one of uh, my fixed IP address. We are using for that uh, node a special IP address range, which is 44130254/24, And it's split it into a dynamic range and a fixed range. So if anybody comes and wants to have a fixed IP address, I will give it out. If not, they just, just go to iGate, type in get IP, like here, iGate. So this is Bernd, DL3 or MFO, he's sitting there. And he connects to the iGate, get an IP address. And if I look up the ARP entries here, you can see there's a dynamic new entry with the call DL4 MFO, and it's valid for 40 days. And this is, if you run an IP stack on your Windows XP, I think 7, it's not possible with that solution, then you can have a normal packet radio call to iGate, and um, here you can see the IP header, the ICMP header for the, from the ping, and you will get the answer. So what I did is, I connect, I, he connected by packet radio to that node, and pinged one IP address, which is in the, I think, in the Washington area. Ten minutes left. Good. So, motivation. <laughs> Why are we doing that? Well, my easy answer is, it's a hobby. I don't care about. <laughs> uh? <laughs> no, seriously. Um, most administrators just want to attach their repeater systems on the internet. So my question is now, you're doing that usually by using these address pools. You could even apply for a Net44 address and go for it. Even if you don't have or don't see the benefit right now, you could do, do this and we could interconnect you to the AMPR network later on. So, the connection to the Net44 provides, we can provide and use services which are only available on Net44. We have a trusted network. Um, packets from Net44 are supposed to come from an amateur radio operator. That, if you know, we could, yeah, I know that some are complaining about this, but that's true and valid for now. I'd ask for Brian. And, um, we can provide gateways to RF even without further authentication of the individual amateur because we know that Net44 is amateur radio. And what is very nice is we could have end-to-end -end communication. So everybody is struggling around with that echo link setup at home. We need to adjust the router, put the port forwarding in and so on. And we could get rid of it if we just use the Net44 with end-to-end -end communication, you don't need to struggle with port forward. Each device has a single IP. We want to build a large RF backbone. And um, yeah, for, you can compare it with Packet Radio. Packet Radio was a backbone network and you run BBS on it. You run services on top. And what we are doing now is we run services on top on a very high-speed network for DATV, voice over IP, packet radio, whatever you can transport on TCP IP, you are free to do. We will build an independent network for emergency communication. At least some do. Um, this is where the funding could come from. And, of course, it's cool because we can. <laughs> yeah, and again, the motivation is learning and exper experimenting. You build your own internet and uh, you get in touch with technology you have never seen before. Usually you have your DSL router and you can get uh, an idea how to deploy an, a home network, but you don't get an idea how to deploy a, a backbone network, and which is not necessarily needed for it. So this is what we learn here, and we even learn, learn how to build our own backhole. 
with gigahertz wave propagation system integration of, of these devices. So some examples. Here's some example. There's a FM repeater group. Here are the red lines. Uh, sorry, this not. This rep uh, the, the main repeater controller is here, and one, two, three other repeater uh, stations which are interconnected by Hamnet are connected to the main controller. And it's working pretty good. Here we have in South Tyrol, where we have the, all the mountains we have just seen, um, we have a setup which is not connected by the internet as far as I know. I'm not sure about it, but they are using the Osterlink software in order to have a repeater network. Here we have ATV live streaming with different users. So they log into the Hamnet and then they are able to share, share video streams. And we even have a social network <laughs> on it. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you don't want to expose this to the internet. So for that reason, we want to have a closed network for it. And we have even some search engines like JC. I don't know how to spell it, but we are working on that. We have some web SDRs. Currently, there we have some uh, contests ongoing in Europe. We could later on. <laughs> Have a look in the spectrum on our web SDR receivers. They are, of course, available on the internet as well because there's no need to block it out. But they are even in the network. And this is my favorite. We built these high tech camps, which makes pictures like this. You will wonder what it is. But this is from a high mountain. This is the skiing area. We have some clouds. It's during the night. Uh, so the city is. Uh, down below, we have the sky and some, yeah, I don't know, UFOs? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you could, you could surf by that, by that website. It's really neat to have a look on photo-webcam.eu. So what do we need to do now? We need more bands. We have heard about 9 centimeter. It's a little bit more expensive. I have seen some uh, three centimeter equipment. We have one, one link running on that. We have some free to use 24 gigahertz in the license free band, but it's very short range only. But what about this? How about self mating up converters and down converters? We could run a, a, a microtic end stream dual, which means you can have one card in TX mode and one card in ARX mode. Hey, uh, just one thing. I, I, so you mentioned nine centimeters. Uh, anybody that's interested in getting into that, uh, please see me. I have some older, but still very good, 802.11a based radio cards for the 3 gigahertz band uh, that'll cover uh, the top 100 megahertz here in the US. I don't know what your band is over there, but uh, see me, they're free, but you actually gotta do something with them. I I'm Brian, KB9MCI. All right. So what else? We need some filtering. What I have seen so far that these devices are very cheap and so far you can see a, a signal which is 10 megahertz broad. You can see 40 megahertz above and even below. So for that we need some filtering in order to get rid of these emissions we see there. And if you have a site which is very, very crowded, trust me, you want to do this because you cannot run too many um, links on there. Yeah, we need definitely some better routing protocols which take into account the packet loss, the changing of the throughput due to adaptive modulation, and which take uh, the quality of the link into account. Otherwise, we get some flapping routes, unreliable connections, and so on. We could try out some of the, the designed protocols for, for mesh networking but um, yeah, for that thing, we have some regions, and each region is free to use their own protocols. And it's really done. We have some of them using OSR, and we have some with OSPF on the network. What else do we need to do? We need to have some more user access technology. And this is the main problem and my main concern. Um, the connectivity is much more important than the speed. You could exchange email with the very low bandwidth, you know. 
And um, if you reduce the bandwidth, the noise, noise gets down and you get some longer range. And it's much better for non-line of sight requirements if you go on the lower bands. So my wish list is to see some equipment which can run these bandwidths in the 70 centimeter band or these bandwidths in the 23 centimeter band, which, which is a little bit, uh, yeah. You might see what happens with the Galileo system in, in, in the UE because they are running on 1260 to 1300. What we did, we already run D star DD mode as a user access on the network 44. This is very neat. And we are, by the way, we are about to finish the implementation of D star DD on the Atos B210. We are not far away anymore. Um, yeah, we need to have some more. Yeah, access to network 44 needs to be definitely improved by RF, more sites, more bands, more technology, by VPN, by IPAP, even by VGP direct connected networks. So we need more material to convince local ISPs to let us announce the network 44 IP address space on the, on the internet. And we need some better instruction for the users, easy ways to connect, and a, just a better worldwide concept. And yeah, now the visions come. <laughs> In the long-term view, I really want to have an intranet for radio amateurs. Um, we want to create a huge intranet and with using the net 44 IP address space. And the user should be able to provide services for other radio amateurs. What I can think of, some people of you are doing ATV transmissions. You know that they are not exposed on the internet. So for that reason, you're just free to, to use it and you're, you're happy that other radio amateurs will, will see it. But if you're, if you're using a normal webcam on the internet, you don't let it run all the time. You, don't, you just want to have your link partners or your users uh, see it. But I could imagine that some people would even run their, their, their webcam just for radio amateurs. And this is what I say here. We try to to get people on the net in order to get end-to-end -end communication. And you just set up at home your webcam and everybody else on the net 44 could access this, but not all the people from the internet. So the chicken egg problem needs to be solved by content on the network, like the, the Hamburg or uh, the search engines. So you need to have some content. I will, to be honest, I really don't have too much knowledge about what, what we are doing there. I'm just responsible for the backbone. <laughs> more or less. And yeah, this is the most biggest problems I think we need to solve in the next future. Maybe on the R A R T I F. <laughs> um, we need a very huge authentication platform which is valid for, for worldwide. We have some ARL Lock of the World certificates which we can use for, for cross um, certification um, which is already used. But we need to have it very, very simple. And we need a very, very easy solution in order to get program authors to adapt this technology and to solve the authentication problem. Just imagine if you, if you want to write an application where your radio amateurs from coming from the internet wants to go on RF. You always have this question valid. That's it. So Q&A. <laughs> yes, please. So yeah, I'm curious, just looking at your map and seeing all your sites, uh, are those typically um, you know, ham users' homes or do you have you know, good access to tower space and buildings or what's your typical backbone type installation look like? We have towers, we have mountains and um, yeah, it depends. If, you're, if you have some activity, act, you have a very active region in, I think in, in Wuppertal in the Cologne area in that area, there, there are so many hams that they even share the network 44 from house to house. So this is very neat. So it's like the, uh, the other, uh, Frei, maybe you know Freifunk. This is a, uh, I don't know how to translate it. Uh, it's a, if you have only short distance hops, then uh, they share internet usually. And what we are doing with sharing a little bit longer hops with the nearest uh, amateur radio uh, nearby. So this is what we do, yes. 
you're using the uh, Microtik uh, software on the Microtik hardware to, for your um, uh, installations, I mean, it, rather than some open source um, product? We do both. We do, do both. both. Uh -huh. um, we use the open protocols with different vendors. So we some use some are using the WRT. 54, for example, and they run their uh, another firmware image, or they use uh, Sub uh, Quaker or Zebra on it to do the routing. So we are free to use what we have. 